안녕하세요. 저는 미국 콜롬비아 신학교에서 온 김수지라고 합니다. I am so grateful to be here with all of you, sharing this message with you. Columbia Theological Seminary is located in Atlanta, Georgia, and we are a PCUSA affiliated school that has a diverse and ecumenical student body and faculty. I'm looking forward to conversations with all of you, faculty, students, and administrators here at Changshinde to strengthen our partnerships and relationships. I'm a firm believer in collaboration and togetherness, uri, right, when it comes to theological education and spiritual formation. I'm a contextual theology professor and a director of contextual education and international partnerships at Columbia. My theological training is practical theology, and what that means for me living here in this world today is that most of my work is done in, through, and with our lived experience. We cycle through the action reflection model to gain glimpses of where God might be and who God may be. As theological students and as theologians, we spend much of our time reflecting on what this embodiment of faith looks like, right? We spend a lot of time thinking about how we better represent the gospel and where God may be. So I want to invite you today to reflect with me on this passage, on this concept of love. As a practical theologian, I like to watch and observe people. I like to see what people are doing. There's something meaningful and valuable in being able to spend some time looking at the world through a specific lens. And for us today, that specific lens is love. Today's text is all about love, right? And this love was given to us, it was shown to us, it was generally showered on us, and it abides in us. And it asks us to do the same thing, give, show, offer, practice, live in and through, and be filled with it. This passage is saturated with this idea and this concept of love that we can't help but feel exhausted by it, but in a good way. It is presented to us in a dramatic, theatrical, and performative way to make a resounding mark in us all about this love. Love is dramatic. Love is performative. It is theatrical, isn't it? One of my guilty pleasures is watching Korean dramas. I love a good romantic comedy, especially Korean romantic comedy. I expect all the emotions, all the, all the drama, the flutter, the feelings, the tingly feelings, the conflict, the argument, the triangulation, and of course, the happy ending, the happily ever after. This satisfaction of living in fantasy for 16 to 20 episodes is heightened when a happy ending gives me closure, right? It's that big bang. I feel as though I live through a fun-filled, heart-wrenching, and heart-filled love story with these characters. But somehow in the end, with all this turmoil and drama, we all prevail and we all fall into our place. A fairy tale ending. But the most recent drama I watched, 2521, did not give me that closure. It left me scratching my head and questioning, well, where is the love? If this romantic love is so powerful, why didn't they end up together? Or why didn't it end the way I expected it to end? Where is the fruit of all of this? right? The fruit was totally not what I expected. And of course, we know that most dramas and movies don't show what happens after the happily ever after. Where is the disappointment? Where is the counseling? Where is the arguments that lead to breakups and more conflict? And where are the lowest of the lows? Today's text is not talking about this love, of course but we can see glimpses of the type of love the writer is talking about. Verses seven, seven and 11 tell us that love is the, what this love is and what we need to do with it. It says, beloved, 
let us love one another because this love is from God. And we know this God, we know this love, then therefore we know God. This love is directional. It came from God, it comes to us, and it moves out of us. And this perfect love has everything to do with the happily ever after that I described earlier. We're going to talk about how God's love is connected to our happily ever after, like in Korean dramas and fairy tales. So follow along. Yes, God's love is dramatic. It is absolutely grandiose. God's love is explosive, right? Of course it is. In light of what's happening out in the world, this love stands in stark contrast. This world is broken. If you are of the Reformed tradition, you would agree with me. The world is simply broken. The world is filled with hate, racism, divisiveness, classism, sexism, war and violence, and injustice. What we hear and read about the world is everything but love, right? The writer of 1 John lived through a different time and different world, but as Ecclesiastes tells us, there's nothing new under the sun. Oftentimes, we're not even surprised by how evil humans are and how depraved our world is. So the text comes to us as an unrealistic demand, a call that seems impossible, a challenge that requires more encouragement guidance than love one another. So as people who study the nature of God, nature of humanity, and the nature of all things that operate, we have to ask difficult questions, and we must answer these difficult questions together. What is love? And how do we embody this perfect love? First of all, we must understand that God is love. Full stop, period, no questions asked. That God is love. Love is not God. God is love. Let's not conflate. God is love because God defines love. Love does not define God. And God's love, this perfect love, saves us. And by saves us, I mean not only salvation in the atonement sense, but it saves us as an active agent that lives in us and operates in the core of humanity to stop us from destroying ourselves and others. It saves us from living in despair and hopelessness. As I said earlier, the world is really, really sad. It, I am reminded daily of how evil humans can be. The stories we hear from Ukraine the ongoing racist and anti-Asian hate in the U.S. and the lack of care and concern for one another that is seen in the world, the way we treat our refugees and displaced people in the world, make me sick in the stomach. One of the last Holocaust survivors died in the recent bombings in Ukraine. The world is simply broken. But what saves us from being engulfed in these horrific stories is that our God defeated evil. Jesus did it. Easter continues. It's not, a, it's not one week in a year. It continues. Despite what we see and hear about the world, we know that God is still calling us to trust in this love, to walk in this love that saves us, to reach for this love that shows us hope, the spirit of Easter, the newness of life, literally saves us from living in despair. Furthermore, it energizes us to transform the way we see each other. God's love moves us. It moves us to see one another, not from human perspectives, but the way God sees us. The writer tells us to love one another because God loves us, right? It's directional. God's, our love is not self-generated. Let's not fool ourselves. We don't have what it takes. We cannot love on our own. Our love for one another is short-lived. It's not gonna last. Human love, whether friendship or romantic, cannot overcome the challenges that lie ahead of us. Humans can do so much and go so far. But what the writer is compelling us to do here, especially in verses 11 and 12, is that we love one another through God's love that overcomes all things, all obstacles, even death. 
This love is the face of God who is invisible. This love is the concrete form of God who may seem abstract. No one's seen God, but when we love, we see God in each other. God lives in and through this love, this love that we possess. When this love moves through us and in us and out to others, the presence of God is palpable. The indwelling of God's presence in our midst is seen and heard and evident when we see and experience radical hospitality, radical inclusion, and radical embrace of others. So many people in our society are ostracized, neglected because they're in the margins. So many of them live in despair and the cracks of injustice and inequity. Those who are food insecure, those who are house insecure, those who are abused and abandoned, those who are disabled, those who are simply different because they're in the margin, they're trying desperately to move to the center. When we're moved by God's love and extend radical hospitality, inclusion, we see God's love being perfected in our midst. Isn't that what God's kingdom is supposed to be? How do we radically and dramatically love? According to verse 17, love has been perfected so that many of us have boldness on that day, the day of judgment. God's love emboldens us. God's love enables us to stand without fear. The concept of perfect love here in this text is not how we understand perfection to be. Perfected in Greek comes from telos, which means goal. So what it's saying is that love's goal is reached or love is perfected when it spurs and creates loving or rather radically and dramatically loving relationships are formed among people. This perfected love will cast out fear. We will knit, live without fear. We will not fear judgment in the end. We will not fear living here on earth. We will not fear facing those who may not love us or oppose us. We will not fear fighting for those in the margins. There's no room for fear in our midst when our relationships are built on dramatic and radical love. Fear paralyzes. We end up remaining silent when we are fearful, but what are we afraid of? We ignore injustice because we're afraid. We fear retaliation, losing what we have, insecurity, hopelessness, and being ostracized. We are afraid of how others might view us, afraid of being disappointed or disappointing others, afraid of not winning, afraid of losing what is rightfully our own. This is the happily ever after. This is the closure I didn't get in 2521. The happily ever after is that we live without fear. Imagine a world where we live without fear. Everybody lived without fear. Imagine if all of us were bold. Imagine us advocating for one another. This is God's love being perfected in us. We live without fear. The dramatic love God has poured on us has an even more dramatic ending. There is no fear. The writer of 1 John tells us that God is light, justice, and love. This light will shine on God's justice when, and it will manifest itself to us as a sense of ethic and moral compass. If it is the church's moral responsibility to be light, to be justice, to be love, to love radically and be hospitable, Instead, we're accustomed to being hostile to one another, seeking our own gain. But siblings, as we enter into ministry or as you continue into ministry, remember this. Remember to reflect on 1 John. God is light, justice, and love. In the spirit of the resurrection, lean into the power of newness that is being formed. In this season of renewal, you are renewed. How can you activate this love and renew this in your world? As a contextual theologian, I invite you to observe and study your community. Where is this dramatic love in your community? 
Where is this explosive love in your community? Who needs this love? Who needs not only to hear, but experience this kind of love? In what ways can you bring God's love to perfection? How do we embody this? Where in your lived experience can you look to love? How would you embody this love in your context, in your community? This love is dramatic. This love is grand. This love knows no fear. What will you do to embody this amazing love? Let us pray. Thank you.